Thank you. It really is hard and challenging. And this is actually a picture of a recent gathering that Minata, the Middle East and North Africa uh, for theological accreditation has uh, put. It was in Jordan. And you can see those who were attending, Michael and myself, are uh, um, to the side of the picture. And there are three other women. One of them is Ali Aboud, who's from Lebanon. And she uh, does so much in terms of education. Uh, the other two work at a Baptist seminary in Beirut in HR and uh, uh, as a registrar. But this was one gathering where I felt particularly sad because I looked around me in the room and there were no other Arab women present, not faculty, not students. And I thought, and I asked this question for everyone. Uh, the theme of the conference was about contextual theology in the Middle East. And uh, recently, a book has been published about the evangelical the theology. And one of the questions that I asked is, where are the women's voices? Where are the women? And then I thought to myself, if I was not a woman, would any of the men who were attending this gathering, would they care? Would they ask? What are the intentional efforts that they are doing to help encourage Arab women in the Middle East? There are many students in undergraduate program and graduate programs up to an MA level. But it is as if they are absent, as if their voices are not there. And I find this very sad because not only it's a lonely field for me as a woman in theological education, but what is the church missing? What is the academy missing? So when I first started my research, I looked and I consulted many Western books and many of these books are here. So there's a book by Ann Taylor, and it has all women throughout the church history. And Dr. Mimi had a presentation the other day about women from the early church. And I really looked hard in every page to find an Arab woman, historically, in theological education. I'm not talking about Eastern women like Saint Nina. You know, these are wonderful role models. But an Arab woman who speaks Arabic, who understands her culture, who understands her context, and I really could not found, find. And I thought it was a paradox. You know, where, where are the women? Could it be that throughout the first 20 centuries, there were no women active in theological education in the church? No one has written about them? So slowly, slowly, as my research developed, I came across a woman from the Maronite tradition. And she is a very interesting woman. Her name is Hindiya al ajami And she lived between the 1720 to the 1798. And to me, it was a partial answer for my research question. I couldn't find these voices within the Protestant tradition initially. So like I was sharing yesterday, I had to look to other traditions. And Hindia is an Arab Syriac Maronite Christian woman. So the Syriac tradition is one of the oldest forms of Christianity in the Middle East from the third century. So this woman, Hindiya, desired to establish a new religious order in a male-dominated context. And I think that her life and ministry offer, offers a paradigm from which Arab women today can gather the courage to engage in theological education and impact their communities in practical way through creative initiatives. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about the Maronite church, it's the only church whose name is in the name of a saint, Saint Maroon, who was a monastic himself. And this church still represents an important part of Eastern Christianity today. It has several distinctive elements, including language, culture, history. It's the language that Jesus, Mary, and the disciples spoke. Uh, so to put into perspective the upbringing of Hindia, the following lines are helpful. Someone writes about Hindia, about the year, of, uh, the year 1735, there was in the neighborhood of the Jesuit missionaries a Maronite girl named Hindia, whose extraordinary way of life began to attract the attention of the people. She fasted, wore a hair cloth, possessed the gift of tears, and in a word had all outward appearance of the ancient hermits, and soon acquired a similar reputation. Everybody considered her a model of piety, and many thought her a saint. So she was born into a Maronite family in Aleppo, Halab, a Syrian town with a Muslim majority. Her religious practices began at a young age. Among the others, among others, they included careful attention to the oral prayer forms and disciplines such as 
fasting and later on in her life she lived in several places so from Halab she moved to Kisrawan and Lepta in Lebanon uh, these are just a couple of pictures this is Halab and then uh, the uh, other picture is of the Maronite uh, patriarchal center uh, in uh, Bkerki uh, I think it's very important to consider this woman because as a woman, her determination to establish a religious congregation was a unique endeavor in its own right. And it was an indication of the dedication of her Christian faith. Later, she became the foundress and mother superior of a group of monastic women. By 1753, her first convent was established with a majority of sisters from Aleppo. Eventually, she expanded to four monasteries. So in my research, I found one sentence about her uh, in a book written by Diana Womack. And she writes, there were women who tried to take lead of religious movements, but the, they were not appreciated by the Catholic clergy. And that sentence puzzled me. I felt like I needed to do more research to see who this woman was and why she did not merit this attention. Although we need to give attention to every woman in the different uh, Christian traditions. But I also asked, can we posit a common cultural struggle for women in the 18th and 21st centuries, despite the profoundly different ecclesial, societal, and cultural context? Notice the similarities between two contexts from the 18th century to the 21st century. Hindiya lived her childhood in a predominantly Muslim context. She lived at the confluence of the encounter between Eastern and Western Christian mission with her own Maronite church and community. She was opposed by her first spiritual leader. And we know many stories where many spiritual leaders do not simply believe in the calling of women, simply because they are women. However, this did not prevent her from making a contribution to literature and theology. And as I talk with many contemporary women, I feel that God is calling me to speak about a renaissance in the Middle East. I really want to see something new. And I think this is the beginning of a renaissance when a, an, a committed evangelical Protestant woman like myself goes back to history and tries to unearth this heritage and find what, who were there, who were the women in the earliest centuries whom we can learn from, whom we can read the writings, whom we can uh, uh, learn from, their personal encounter with the Lord and the many ways uh, in which God spoke to them. Hindiya has many works. Uh, most are directly related to spirituality. For example, Sir al-Ittihad, the mystery of the union. So when I teach spiritual and character formation to my female students, why do I have to draw on Western resources to tell them what spiritual formation is? Why aren't her resources known and read and translated? So that's one question. Uh, there, later I found that there were other people who wrote about Hindiya, for example, Avril Makhlouf, also Bernard Heberger, who writes about Christianity in the Middle East. Akram Khater also writes the story of Hindiya. He writes about her works and how she uh, adhered to the direction of her spiritual advisors, but still formulated her own views. And she was always attentive in securing ecclesiastical permission before fulfilling what she viewed as God's will. Hindiya's mystical life is unfamiliar in the Maronite context. However, when viewed through the lens of other mystic Western women who endeavor to become sacralized, the experiences are rendered common. The fact that a woman, namely Hindiya, was a pioneer in her own right in the Maronite tradition before the emergence of these individuals People like Butrus al-Bustani, Ahmed Faris al-Shidyaq, uh, Germanus Farahat. We know about these people because they are men, but we don't know about Hindiya because she was a woman. So these were the men who contributed to the Nahda, to the Renaissance in the Arab world in the 19th century. And it is about time that we learn about women. And, and sometimes as an evangelical, perhaps it's not approved by leaders within the Protestant community that I, for example, go and visit a Maronite church or that I tell my students about these women from the Eastern Christian tradition. But I don't think this is right. I think this is the beginning of a new way, the beginning to find a renaissance, to work together, to learn together. The overarching representation of Christianity as a Western import is challenged by demonstrating how Hindiya and other Arab women Arabized Christianity even as they Christianized Arabic. 
And that's something that I encountered. Often. People ask me, when I say I'm a Christian from Bethlehem, from Palestine, one of the questions they say, they say Pakistan. Many people don't know that there are Christians in Palestine. And then the other question I get is, when did you convert? I was born as a Christian. My parents were Christian. My grandparents, my great grandparents, all the way, they were Christians in this region from the first century, even as we read the powerful account when the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples. There were Arabs. There were people who spoke Arabic. But profiling an Eastern woman who was culturally bound resonates with the lives of so many Arab Protestant women today. However, in such cases, doing theology is not an insignificant endeavor. It encourages women to engage in theological education in the present and future generations. So Hindiya has become a story, part of the story, part of the narrative I am writing. Because without her, without her accomplishments, and many other women, like uh, Rifka, for example, is another uh, uh, example of a Maronite woman then my story would be incomplete. I have to see the roles of these women before I talk about my role and the role of many other women. So as we seek today to open space for women leaders, a look back at how Eastern women were involved throughout church history is appropriate. It's fitting. And this is why my work seeks to open space for women as lay theologians, not only to be within uh, the ordained ministry, but for them to understand how theology is articulated in their day-to-day -day life. So centuries later, today, within the Maronite Church, what's taking place? In March 2022, just a few months back, a synod for women was established by the Maronite Church. And yes, this is a very unique and an interesting development because it's a singular ecclesial process initiated in the Maronite community as a step forward for shared discernment regarding the presence and mission of women in church and in society. And I think it's very fitting for this to happen now, because not only does it include women from the Maronite church, but it's open for women from other traditions. There, there are, for example, Najla Kassab, who is a Protestant, and she is involved in this initiative. I went to Lebanon and I met with Mirna Mzawak, who is the, uh, um, the lead woman in the pastoral team. And she is going from one uh, parish to the other, talking to men leaders and telling and sharing about this vision for Arab women, Arab Maronite women in partnership with other women. And I think she's a brave woman, although she's not a theologian, she's an anthropologist. But she has taken this responsibility to share the voices of women. So I see hope, I see a future there. Although historically the voices of women have been absent, I think a new thing is emerging. And I have to think of the biblical verse when Isaiah speaks about this vision or this reality of new things rising up in the wilderness. And sometimes I feel we do live in a wilderness but nothing is impossible. I think one step at a time, we can bring about this change. This is Mirna Mzawak, and in her uh, interview, she says some powerful words. She says, in reality, I have the honor to be coordinating this project, which is the first in the Western and Eastern Church for women to have a synod for their own. I don't think this has happened in the Western world. The outstanding thing is that it is an ecumenical project. Through this initiative, the Maronite Church is welcoming Eastern and Western churches, including evangelical entities. With all churches, we are working with the committee experts in theology, philosophy, anthropology, and bibliology. We also welcome delegates from all convents. We will work together in collaboration as men and women. She speaks about women as a mother women as a wife, women as a teacher, women as a thinker, women who have a voice within the society. But also, we must not overlook that Arab women have another distinctive marker, and it has to do with suffering. When I think of Western women, I try and think, what suffering do they go through? And I'm sure there are many. But when I think of my own context, it's very difficult to begin to even number the pain 
the amount of pain and the suffering that we go through on a day-to-day -day basis and how challenging this is and how easy it would be for us to give up and to say no to God's calling. But I've also seen through the many women I have interviewed for my research that these women are determined. They want to see a change. They are not happy with what is going on. They are not happy that they do not have a voice. So it's important not to overlook the pain and the suffering that they go through. When I think of simple things like traveling, it takes me such a long time to travel from my home in Bethlehem to go to a place like Jordan. I have to go through multiple checkpoints and barriers. Although the airport is literally 45 minutes from my home, but because I am a Palestinian, I am not allowed access, for example, to the Israeli airport. And I have to go through a very burdensome journey through Jordan that takes up to 12 hours during the summer just to get to the other side. There is so much humiliation, but God gives us strength. In order for me to get to Lebanon, I have to wait and apply for a visa in order for me to get to anywhere else in the world. It's a complicated process. But thankfully, the Lord makes a way. He makes a way in the wilderness. He makes a way to help us talk about our mission and our vision as Christians in the land of Christianity. It's the cradle of Christianity. And I believe as women, we can contribute to strengthening Christianity in the Middle East, regardless of the suffering. Everyone knows that Lebanon, for example, is a corrupt state. I was talking to one of my students and she and I asked her whether she considers leaving like many other Lebanese. And she says the, the one difficult thing she struggles with is the corruption. How can she stay in a corrupted state? And that's a huge question for many Arab women in the Middle East. I feel as a researcher, I can bring life to the history of women leaders when I unearth these examples and I ask myself, how did their leadership become so invisible over the years? Even when the church today seems less interested in investing in women's leadership than previous generations, there is vital work women can do. I was having a, a chat with someone earlier today and a couple came and approached me and, and they said, we were really shocked to know that the challenges sometimes come from within the church. It's not from the Muslims. It's not necessarily from the Israelis. It's from within your own community. This is something that we have to reflect on. This is something that we have to pray about and ask for a change. Not only there are women within the Maronite church like Hindia, but also the Coptic church. Ever since I was a child, I really fell in love with the Egyptian church. I was inspired by their faith, their dedication. I remember my father would always bring us uh, videos back then to watch about the Egyptian church and the ministry of children, the ministry of youth. And I always felt envious inside. And I looked at my context in Palestine with the one or two percent of Christians, but yet consider the persecution that the Egyptian church goes through and how inspiring that is, how inspiring that is for the revival that I want to see in my own nation. So the Egyptian church has been in the Middle East, since the beginning of Christianity, its, its establishment uh, goes back to the evangelism of St. Mark. And I think that's profound, that's beautiful to reflect on. It's a faithful church. And I am always uh, proud of what God is doing within the Egyptian church. I must say, I was fascinated by the Egyptian women I met. Many of them have backgrounds in pharmacology, engineering, but yet they still want to study. They want to be theologically educated. So if we go back to the history of the early desert mothers, women were always there. But recently, there are also modern women monastics. Mother Irini is an example. She lived between 1936 to 2006, and she was the mother superior of the convent of Abi Sefen. She played a major role in the revival and reformation of Coptic monasticism for women. We often hear about Matal Miskin, for example, who was involved in this revival, uh, Egyptian revival, but we don't hear about women. So here's an example of a woman who established the groundwork for religious practices for Copts and non-Copts as other Christians around the world. She is considered as one of the leaders who brought about a revival within the Coptic church. 
as a female leader within the Coptic revival, she is mentioned along with figures such as Pope Kyrillus. She was a saintly person endowed with visionary and spiritual capacity. Not only did she lead a life of prayer, visions, and frequent encounters, but she was a gifted manager, leader, and teacher with a, a leadership style that was deeply embedded in her spiritual experiences. I think that's beautiful. Sometimes we look at leaders in the Middle East, even church leaders, men or women, but we feel like they are lacking this spirituality. And there's always, there tends to be this clash between the academia and spirituality. And I think it's beautiful when we reflect on Arab women who are spiritual, who are humble, who are meek, who understand Jesus' words. Uh, they were written in their own context. And I think sometimes when we read the scriptures as Arab women, we have a different perspective. What does it mean to me personally? To love your neighbor like yourself when i'm humiliated every day what does it mean for the egyptian woman to forgive when their churches are bombarded when many people have lost their lives what does it mean for the lebanese woman to have hope regardless of the corruption that there is in their country so that's another example uh, and that's another thing that mother irini has done and has showed and demonstrated for many contemporary coptic women So the principles that Mother Irini uh, initiated were applied in other convents, not only in her own convent, for women throughout Egypt and beyond. There's another example of a, a, a very brave and courageous woman. Her name is Mother Louis Faraj. She's a Coptic nun, but she teaches at a Luther, Lutheran seminary in Minnesota. And I think you know that's for a nun to teach and to be in this space. It's very unusual. But then I ask why, why, why someone like her did not stay in Egypt? Was she given the space? Did she feel like her voice was heard like many other women? And sometimes I want to see women and I want to draw on these resources. But where are they? In the past two decades, so many people have left the Middle East. Many people are forced to leave the Middle East. Uh, you know, myself is an example. I'm married to an Egyptian. The government makes it difficult for my husband to have a visa to live in Bethlehem. So what do I do? The easy option is to come to the States. And I can come to the States. I have a valid green card and I can live here and we can establish an easy life, a comfortable life, contrary to the life that we have experienced in the past three years. But we love our people. We love our context. And we believe that God has people in, in the Middle East, that God wants to bless the Middle East, that God wants to use women to bless people in the Middle East, to encourage and inspire them. So that's an example uh, from a, the Coptic Church. And we had an example from the Syriac Maronite Church. But also, as I read uh, Diana Womack's book about Protestants and gender in the 19th century, about the Renaissance, she writes about women and she gives names of nine Nahdawi women. The Arabic word for Renaissance is Nahda. So the women who lived during the 19th century and who were active in that period are called the Nahdawi women. So in describing this ecclesial and historical milieu in which Arab Protestant women in the Middle East are situated, we have to give particular attention to this period. And to be honest, if it wasn't for Western women like Diana Womack, like Christine Lindner, who search and research about these women, then I wouldn't know about them. Protestant mission is remarkable. It helped shape the contribution of Arab women. But I have to ask, do we always have to rely on Western women? Why can't we work together? Why can't I make a space for Arab women theologians to start uh, reading and writing and unearthing this heritage to build on what other people, the research that other people have established? Many, like these researchers, Womack and uh, Lindner, for example, they reveal names and contributions of Arab women who made a difference during the Nahda period, thus paving the way for Arab women in current times. We all know how uh, a diligent Protestant mission were in establishing theological schools. All the theological schools that are accredited by Minata, for example, or most of them, were established by, F, by missionary efforts, whether in Egypt, it was the Presbyterian missionaries, in Lebanon, it was the Baptists, in uh, Palestine, the Lutherans and the Anglican, uh, but also the Presbyterian. So these voices from the Protestant mission are important. 
I'll just read their names because they are important. Alice Albustani, Farida Atiya, Salma Tannouz, Aziza Aboud, Rujina Shik Shukri, Maryam Zakka, Hanna Kurani, Julia Tu'ma al Dimashkiya, and Salma Badr. So these, excuse me, were unusual women. They signed their names to sermons and articles on education for the mission periodical in the 1880s and published books and novels in the 1890s. In Womack's words, she says, these largely neglected texts put the Nahdawi Protestant women at the forefront of the Arab woman's awakening, which gained momentum in the early 20th century. Shaped by missions institutions of higher education, Nahdawi women were able to exert their influence on their society through literature, through becoming writers in their context and beyond. Even though they were characterized as low theology as opposed to high theology, they didn't do, for example, systematic theology. But we have to start somewhere. And low theology has the potential to always develop to high theology. So we've had voices from the Syriac church, the Coptic church during the Nahda period, but also there are current voices. In my research, I interviewed about 56 women in theological education. Many of them are doing postgraduate degrees. And I listened to their stories, their experiences, their struggles, their challenges, the cultural and religious challenges the sometimes biblical challenges, but I also talk to men in theological education because naturally in the Middle East, men are the decision makers. And I wanted to see what can we do to help these women. In analyzing my interviews, there were so many things, so many important things that women said about positive support from the church and sometimes about negative negativity from the church about women's involvement in ministry, about the culture's influence, women's ordination, higher education, family demands, about rela the relationship of Protestant women to the other, about the support of theological institu institutions or not, about women role models, about feminist theology, gender, theological resources, libraries, hospitality within the Arab cultures, women theologians. I'll read just a few quotes of what some of my participants said to help you understand how Arab women in theological education think today. One, someone said, the question is why? Why are there only five or six women in the Middle East who are undertaking postgraduate theological research, as in doctoral research? We think that theology is for men. However, theology is life. Women have a theological voice that carries within. It's the voice of the mother, the wife. The voice of women whom men cannot emulate. We are different to men in the way of our thinking, analysis, the way we read the scriptures. Women should have a theological voice in the church and society. For this reason, our churches are impoverished and the Middle East is lagging behind given the number of women whose potential and roles are not being employed in the right way. Another one said, my dream is to have female Arab theologians as we are guided by Western theologians in Europe, such as Karl Barth, Paul Tillich, and many others, we can easily see how much they have influenced Christian history and the church. I believe that one day women will be history makers in the MENA, the Middle East and North Africa region, and will lead the future generations in their faith. Someone else said, in all its simplicity, theological education would say to the oppressed Arab woman, your rebellion is not against God. When you rebel against what is unjust, you are in fact at the center of God's will. And I think this is so powerful. To be a full human, not a deficient one, is God's will for your life. It's time to teach about the role of women in the Arab church. Seminaries need to teach about female models who enriched Arab Christian history. Besides, they should focus on the abilities women have that enable them to play a vital and effective role in the kingdom of God. Women in the MENA need to see how they are viewed by the church. Another one said, Frankly, I would love to see more women in theological college achieving leadership positions. And how difficult this is. How difficult it is for an Arab woman to be involved in the decision-making process. In all honesty, I know of women in Asia and Africa who are senior leadership positions, which is encouraging. In the Middle East, we are arriving late at this stage. And I've asked women, why? Why are you doing theological education? And many said, not merely for the sake of obtaining a degree. I don't want a certificate. In their Egyptian accent, they said, I need to go wider as I study theology. 
go deeper. And some said, we want to obtain more knowledge. When I first started going to church, a participant said, coming from non-Christian background, I wanted to acquire more knowledge to find answers for difficult questions. Many women were saying, we serve in youth groups and the youth come up to us and ask us difficult questions and we don't know how to answer them. Some said following an, inspired mo an inspiring model or finding encouragement from others. Some women were encouraged to pursue theological education by a clergy figure, a relative, a spouse, family member, a father. And this was particularly outstanding because we often think that men and women should not work together, but it's not the case. I myself have experienced the support of male figures, my father, my brothers, my husband, my male teachers who affirmed my calling and who said, you can go further. And this is what we need to see in our societies. And many said that they, they study because they want to arrive at biblical truth. Some have passion for teaching women to be educated themselves. Some want to know God deeper, to be set apart for ministry. And this term, atafarragh lil khidma, is usually used by men. But I was interested to hear women saying that they too want to be set apart for ministry in a deeply patriarchal context. Some were promised a scholarship. Some wanted to obtain a certificate, among other things. And these are the things that give women status if they have a title, if they have a certificate, if then maybe they will get a place. It's not automatic. It's not natural. They have to fight. They have to work harder than men to prove themselves, to find their voice. And some have studied theology because they've been through difficult circumstances. Very few have talked about the sense of calling. And this is one thing that I'd love to see change. I'd love to see Arab women talking about God's calling in their lives, regardless of the difficult context they go through. So how can contemporary Arab women serve? It's not many theological leaders in the Middle East link theological education to ordination. So they're hesitant to support women. They say, we don't want women to be ordained. So we don't support them. We don't invest in them financially. But there are a plethora of roles that women can do. They can serve in leadership positions, pastoral care, chaplains, mentors, academic positions, lecturers, professors, researchers, translators, leaders of various ecclesial and ministerial positions involved in discipleship training. And I, I really I'm standing here and I feel very humbled at God's grace, how God has really given me through various stages of my life the opportunity to serve in these various positions and roles, not only for my own development, but to help others, to help my community, to help my church. And I'm always missed every time. I feel there, there is something lacking when women are out of the picture. And I really want to see this change by being this model for, for women. Many women cannot imagine what is beyond. Sadly, many women finish their BA degrees and they shift to other things. They go to become beauticians or something that has nothing to do with theology. But how can we encourage women to even combine their love for some secular fields with theology, for example? Recently, I met a, a wonderful young Egyptian woman, and she her first major is in arts, and now she's doing an MA in theology, and she wants to mix between art and theology. And I thought that was so profound, so beautiful. And I made every effort to encourage her and to tell her how unique what, uh, uh, what, she, uh, what she's doing. And I think all these initiatives help us to affirm one another. Women can also serve in curriculum design. Just consider the curriculum in the Middle East, written by male, for male students, designed by this community of male leaders. Where are the voices of women? Do we suggest books? that are written by women? Do we talk about women in the church history? About women missionaries, evangelists, theologians? Sometimes I also uh, have conversations with women and we talk about mission and they say we would love to serve as missionaries. But then our parents say, if someone goes with you, if you go for two weeks, if, and they put all these conditions and then women feel restricted. They feel they cannot be themselves. They cannot go beyond what they have. So 
I really want to encourage you today to pray for the church in the Middle East, to pray for the academy in the Middle East, to pray for men and women. And I really pray that in 10 years, that we will see a change, we will see a paradigm shift, we will see a renaissance, we will see a nahda among Arab women in the Middle East. I'd like maybe um, we have some time and maybe if you have any questions or if you'd like to inquire specifically about anything, uh, I'd love to hear from you some of your thoughts and, and maybe just some ideas that we can partner together to help Arab women in theological education. Yeah, thank you so much. This is a great question. I really appreciate the West and the impact that the West has had on my life. In 2009, I went to the UK for the first time to pursue an MA, and I, I'd finished a BA in Bethlehem, and I went to, to the London School of Theology. And I must say, I was really shocked. I thought to myself, no way, I am going to fail. I had no idea about what's going on, what the students are saying, the, the theological discussions, and I felt very inadequate. So I think the West can really help the East in terms of resources, in terms of partnerships in this way, books, but also it's important for the Western church to come to the Middle East and see firsthand what's going on, what are the challenges. It's one thing to hear about these challenges, but it's another thing to come and see, to meet with people, to worship in our churches, to have a meal with us. We are known for our uh, hospitality, and, and in, we're not just saying this, but we love people, we love to get to know the other. And that is key point in our connections, to extend a hand of love and appreciation, friendship really to begin with, a mutual prayer support is amazing. Often we go through situations and we really don't know what to do, but to know that there are people who are interested uh, in us, who are praying for us. Uh, um, I, uh, I want to draw on this example on Dr. Mimi. This is the first time I've met Dr. Mimi in person. And we've been in touch for many years now, but I've always been touched by her words. She is someone who cares. She would email me and Perhaps she heard like we're going through some instability with visa situations and she asks and she encourages and her words are poignant. And to me, you know, I, I just felt like, you know, who am I that I'm getting these words of encouragement? And to me, that meant the world. And I want to do this to other women. I want to do this to other people. Just having this beginning is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, no, no. Not this one. That one. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, uh, Dr. Well, thank you so much, Grace. You are so, so strong. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your voice. Thank you for speaking to us yesterday and, and today. Um, thank you. You know, one of, one of the things I'm wondering is uh, I come from Mm. Um, but it's a minority of people, and then mm. the voice of women is, mm. is high. Mm. Mm. So is there a place, and this is a public question, but is there a place for, for us to bring together strong voices like Grace, and you know, maybe African countries, Nigeria, Congo, together so that people can hear each other's voices? Mm. Yeah, thank you. That That is uh, um, an interesting and a fascinating, I, I would see this as a fascinating initiative. They always refer to us as majority world scholars. And I think it's wonderful to have a united voice, to be together, to listen to one another's struggles and challenges. Uh, it, like the example you mentioned in India, and I know how difficult and challenging it must be for Indian women to even have 
uh, this voice or to have this space. So there will be strength in us coming together. I would very much welcome being a part of this initiative. I would welcome seeing this initiative. And I myself am committed to do whatever I can and to offer whatever I have to help other women, even from different contexts. I'm not only interested in the Middle East, I'm interested in the world. And I think this tapestry of women from different backgrounds and different languages and cultures is beautiful. There is so much richness. But of course, we cannot do it on our own. So we have to look for resources. We have to look for organizations and for, for people to, to connect us together. And this is my vision for my region and beyond. Yeah. May I ask a follow-up question? Yes, sure. So in, you know, in the Middle East, uh, what are the opportunities that women have of getting advanced degrees, PhD? Yeah. By God's grace, you've been able, you're a yes. scholar. Yes. You know, you're an amazing thinker. Uh, but that probably is not available to all Arab women. What no. are the opportunities that Yeah. Have? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Thank you so much. It, it's very, very difficult because, like I said, there are no PhD programs in the Middle East for women. There are MA degrees, but when we say an MA in the Middle East, one has to understand that it's not at the same level of an MA offered in the West. There are huge gaps that I want to see filled. Like, I love my students so much, but sometimes it really is a struggle to get to them how to think and how to research. You have to start from the very, very basic, simply because our system, our educational system on the Arab, in the Arab world is based on memory. So for the first 12 years of my life, I studied the book, I memorized it, I had an exam. Never, never ever was I asked, what do you think about this? Never. And when I went to the West, this is the first time I encountered this type of thinking, critical thinking, constructing an argument, making a debate, not for the sake of making a debate, but just for the sake of developing our thoughts and ideas further. And I think there's richness in this. So there are not many opportunities for women to pursue postgraduate studies. If they are, or like if there's an opportunity for them to do a PhD, then they have to leave their context and it's difficult. So some people just, you know, your husband wouldn't allow you to go. Your parents would say no. They would say, when, when you come back, you'll be too old to get married or you'll never have children. So the, the culture is terrible in this way. It puts all these restrictions on women. And then a woman is left with no choice. What do I do? You know, I, I'll get married to the first person who comes to my father and, ask my, and asks my hand. And that's it. And then I'm a mother and I have children and whatever education I have uh, is a waste, sadly so. But we have, we have, like, uh, we really must take initiatives like scholarships. Uh, I had to get scholarships from different places because there is no way I could finance myself, particularly studying in the West. No way. And then when I was studying, I could not keep my teaching uh, position. I was put all of a sudden in a difficult circumstance. I had to leave my home, my country, my family, and then think, now what? You know, I, I felt stranded. But God is good, and he sees the desires of our heart. He sees our passion. So I hope that there will be, like, a PhD is a major milestone for an Arab woman. I can really count on my fingers the number of women. In Palestine, I, to, to my knowledge, I think I'm only the third woman with a PhD. The two uh, previous women, one, uh, uh, Viola Rahib, uh, has had her PhD for a long, long time now, and she resides in Germany. And the other, Nivin uh, Saras, uh, is an ordained minister, and she left Bethlehem. Uh, she serves in Wisconsin, I believe, in the Lutheran Church. And then there's another uh, uh, young woman, Tala Rahib, who's pursuing a PhD currently. Uh, but she resides in the States. She's married to an American. And then wh where, where are the women, really? Where, how, can, how can we see this change if we didn't have this education? Uh, what do you think of women PhDs at Sorry. Yes. Yes, there are PhDs, but it's not in theology. 
So even even like I said, there are no PhDs in Protestant theology. There are in Lebanon. There are two universities: uh, the uh, uh, San Joseph and the uh, uh, Keslik, and they offer PhDs in like. Eastern Christianity and for a Protestant woman just like some of the tensions I've been talking about to go and to study there it would be considered as a taboo or as a shame why would you leave your evangelical faith so this sort of partnership is not evident in the Middle East when I finished my MA I wanted to teach so I went to uh, naturally I studied at the Time Bible College this is the place that would welcome me and they welcomed me wholeheartedly of course but I also wanted to have you know very Yes, connection. So I went to Bethlehem University and I talked to the priest and they did not welcome such a thing. The minute that they knew I am committed to the evangelical church, it wasn't part of their vision. Or And that's difficult because we are a minority. How can we change this? Even, you know, on the other, for example, as the Palestinian, I always speak on the other side of the wall. There are many resources, theological libraries in Israel, and I, and I can't get access. Jerusalem is five miles from Bethlehem. I can't. I'm not given permission to get there. So this makes multiple layers of complexities. Can I say something? Yes, please. I know that I mean, the way you are describing it, it mm. looks like Mm -hmm. for us but as I hear you I also feel hope that the Lord will mm -hmm. do great work for us Amen. the things that we cannot do mm -hmm. he will do mm -hmm. it might not take um, I mean, it might not be tomorrow mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. know that you being here is already part of him mm -hmm. doing those things mm -hmm. so Amen. Thank you so much. That's a great encouragement. I do appreciate it. Thank you, particularly coming from you. <laughs> and we need to involve, you know, like our power, the mm. theological association. Mm. Mm. So let's keep talking. Yes, yes. Actually, Yes, yes, Asia Theological Association. My first conference when I started my PhD, uh, I went to Manila and I, uh, and I just shared a small presentation there. And just reflecting back on how I developed and how I matured, and it's really incredible to have women be part of these associations, associ associations, excuse me, these conferences, these gatherings, because it's mind blowing. It just exposes you to a completely different world. What's out there? Who is writing? Who is working? And that's very, very special. No. I haven't. I'd love to meet her. Yes. Yes, I'd love to meet her. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Kim. I need them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. This is this is a great question because really, like you are privileged, and I'm very happy you're privileged. Uh, you know, I I thank God that you can experience freedom in so many ways. Just even in terms of physical freedom, if you wanted to go from state to another, from country to another. No one cares. No one asks you for an ID, for a permission, for a card, nothing. So uh, 
I think it's good that we continue this conversation, that we are open to what possibilities are out there. Just maybe simple things like having the voices of Arab women, just to write something or to attend a gathering, uh, maybe just to ask once in a while what's going on, what can we do, how can we help, um, yeah, to make us aware of things that we are not aware of, what, what conversations are taking place. I think that's very, very important. And to continue build this uh, friendship, uh, even resources, books, commentaries, maybe like we can try and translate some of the books or, you know, there's so much that we can do, help maybe mentor uh, a young woman, you know, you, for example, uh, Kim, you, you've got your degree. How can you help a young Arab woman who, who has no idea about this Western education? Uh, read someone's essay, uh, just practical and simple things like that. Give comments. Uh, everything matters and everything is of help. You know, uh, uh, if you hear of a scholarship or anything, invite someone to your home, for example, someone to speak at your church or all these things make a huge difference. Yeah, it, it, you are, unfortunately, this privilege is used in a wrong way sometimes, and don't misunderstand me. So if Western women come mm. to our context, for example, uh, they would be privileged in a church, in a sense, for example, they can give communion to the local community, whereas an Arab woman cannot stand and do anything or say a prayer. Or So we have to be wise and faithful in the gifts that God has given us and use them in a contextually sensitive way way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a follow-up question to that, actually, just that many Westerners who are in the Middle East have such stories. What are mm. some ways that they are sort of yeah, yeah, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. And I, I myself have been so blessed by the missionaries and even many of the women I talked to, their role models were these missionaries because they couldn't find necessarily Arab women, they looked at these women missionaries, they, they, the women, Arab women were telling me, you know, these women understand the language, they studied the language, they served, they understand the, the context. And when I talk to missionary women, uh, the number one thing they struggle with is the demands of hospitality. So they always say, we can't keep up with the Arab culture in this way. <laughs> so they say, we send, we ask our, our husbands or spouses to do the, um, the hospitality. But uh, there are many good examples, like the, the, um, the scholar I mentioned yesterday, Moira Dale. She was so humble. She lived in difficult places and uh, she extended a hand of help to everyone whether they're Muslim or Christian, but at the same time, she understood. She took time to know the people, know the context, to help, to write. And these are all helpful things as opposed to just coming and, you know, say, I'm a Westerner, I'm privileged, I can do whatever I like, I can go wherever I like. So it's good to feel with the insider and to be an insider as much as you can rather than an outsider coming. Yeah. Okay, not sure, are, are we supposed to finish at 5, 11? Maybe to, if nobody else has any other questions, perhaps I could just ask one or two to conclude our time with prayer and ask the Lord to help us, to strengthen us. Uh, remember our church in the Middle East, our families, our students, um, people who are struggling to find their voice and place and space in the academy. Anyone who's... Let's let to pray, please. Mm -hmm.